Hi everyone and welcome to today's video. As promised in the last video, this one is going to be about the future of the park. But if you haven't seen that last video, I suggest you go check it out because it had a detailed look at the state of the hill and how it's been left after the felling work. Before I get into the future of the park though, let me say thank you so much for all the support on the last video. It got great views and some great traction, but also a huge amount of great comments and a lot of useful questions being asked. Now, in order to keep this video to a reasonable length, I'm not gonna cover all those comments in this video, but I will be doing that in a future video or possibly even a live stream Q&A if we think people might be interested in that. So that's enough about the future of the videos. Let's have a chat about the future of the park. So for the last few months, we have been putting together plans which will allow us to restart operation of the park, reopen the business without waiting years for the trees to mature. So to try and better explain what we've got planned, I thought I'd bring you outside to show you. So the primary development we're looking to do will be a large indoor jump building. Now this will be a agricultural style building as big as we can kind of make it while still fitting it in sensitively into the site. Looking behind me here it's likely to be in the lower area down there towards the road where you can probably see the lorry collecting some of the last of the timber right now. As well as this indoor jump facility we'll also be looking to further develop the riding in the lower area hopefully with a pump track and some kind of skills area. The final step of adding riding facilities at the lower will be to redevelop the quarry, potentially developing some kind of slope style park, which will not only be used for events, but will also be open to the public. Alongside these improved riding facilities will also be improved catering facilities, probably not a full on cafe, but certainly improved seating area, which will be covered and make it a bit more comfortable for riders and non-riders to enjoy a coffee or some lunch. We will also once and for all be getting rid of our crappy portaloos and replacing them with some proper toilet facilities with showers and changing rooms. You can also see behind me underneath the mountains of brash, we have already done some improvements to the landscaping of the site and we've also done a lot of work to bring in topsoil and clean material to cover up the ground but also allow for grasses and other plants to regrow onto the site and we'll be taking the landscaping to its final state in this new development. So hopefully you can at least picture what we're talking about when we talk about the lower area but before it starts to rain again let's head back inside and talk about how we're going to get there. Now obviously this is a slight deviation from our current business model that focuses on your sort of hardcore downhill riders but there's a couple of significant reasons why we've decided to go down this route. First and foremost is as I said before this allows us to get the park up and running again and start generating some revenue which will allow the park to survive for the long term. It will also give us an opportunity to create some much better facilities at the bottom of the hill which will benefit the downhill park when that comes back. So does this mean that we've forgotten about the downhill riders who have loved and supported the park for all these years? Absolutely not. The primary aim of this approach is to sustain the business for the foreseeable future while we actually refocus and rebuild the downhill park. Having the park operating as well will allow us to utilize the hill when the weather permits and as the work up there has been done. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who would love to be able to get back on the hill and ride particularly tracks like Vision and 50 to 1. And with the park in operation, there's no reason that we couldn't allow ride ups, e-bikes, enjoys, etc., to go up there and ride those and also run some limited uplifts when the weather permits and when there's demand for them. This new model will make this possible because we will have a sustainable way of generating revenue to pay for staff and things like that, which will allow the park to be open and therefore throwing on a couple of uplifts when we're already operating is a lot easier than trying to do that from scratch. With the park back up and running, it will also allow for things like events, races, jam days, sessioning days, etc. All these are going to be possible once we're back up and running because we'll have the resources to be maintaining the hill and maintaining the site which we don't currently have. This new approach will also allow us to open up the park to more riders beyond just downhill. Whilst downhill has always been our core, we've always aimed at being able to attract more types of riders to the site. The creation of jump facilities and things like that is an obvious extension, but there's other less obvious ones that we could go down as well. We sit in the center of a pretty extensive extensive bridleway network, which would be great for things like gravel riders and cross country. 
Now, unfortunately, a lot of these bridal ways are in a pretty sorry state of affairs, but if we can get a sort of hub set up going, we can potentially put money and resources into improving those bridal ways and creating all kinds of cross country and family type loops from this destination. Another slightly odd deviation, but one that would make sense for this site, is to expand it into road cycling. Whilst road cyclers and downhillers are not always obvious partners, we sit at the bottom of an infamous climb up onto the Berwyn Mountains, which is a part of a greater loop between Bala, Lake Vernwy and here. And if we can create a nice place for road cyclists to start and finish at, you know, that could be another potential business for the park being generating parking fees or them getting a coffee after their long grueling loop around the roads. It's also important to realize that this park is an important business for the local area. It provides a lot of jobs as well as income into other supporting businesses. Many of the local pubs, B&Bs and shops, etc. benefit significantly from the visitors that the park brings to the area. And with the park shut down, they're certainly feeling the pinch. Whilst this approach might not get us back to our core business and core market, it does allow us to stop re-bringing some of those benefits back to the area, recreating some of those jobs, and as I say, creates a foundation for growth into the future. Now, let me just reiterate at this point, whilst these are some exciting plans, they are at this stage just plans. And as with all plans, they are subject to change and cancellation for many reasons. We have some really important steps that we have to get through in order to make this a reality. And I am going to go through that in a minute, but I just want to say that I'd love to hear what your comments and feedback on this idea are. I appreciate it might not be what everyone's expecting, so I'd really like to hear your thoughts on it, so make sure to comment below about that. Whatever happens though, we will be keeping you updated through these YouTube videos and hopefully documenting the entire rebuild and rebirth of Revolution Bike Park. So make sure to subscribe to the channel because that's how you're gonna find out what's going on. So how are we going to make these plans into a reality? Well, as I said, we've got a number of steps to get through, so let's have a chat about that. But before I do, I want to introduce you to today's sponsor. So to make these videos, I come here and prattle into the camera for a couple of hours, but that is only a tiny part of the work that goes into them. The main bulk of the work is done by Jo, who some of you may know is the park photographer. She's also my partner and she is the one who spends days and days sitting at a computer editing these videos together so that we can keep you informed of what's happening with the park. Jo does this purely voluntarily. We're not able to pay her, unfortunately, to do it. And these videos don't generate anywhere near the amount of income it costs to make them. So as a thank you for all of that hard work, we agreed that this video would be sponsored by her other business, JH Lever. Whilst not being a cinematographer and a filmmaking expert, Joe is also a leather crafter who makes incredibly high quality leather products. However, her main business is actually teaching other people to do leather crafting, which she does through her YouTube channel, JH Lever. With Christmas just around the corner, I'm sure like me, you are scratching your head as to what you're gonna get for your friends and loved ones this year. Well, fortunately for you, I have the perfect gift. If you know anyone who is into crafting or think might be interested in leather work, then check out Joe's website where she has some amazing make-along kits and pattern kits which allow you to make the products you see on her YouTube channel. Her make-along kits come with everything you need to make a beautiful product like a belt, a wallet, card holder, key rings and many more. And they're all available through her website. The link is on the screen now and in the description. With the help of the detailed videos on her YouTube channel, anyone can make these beautiful products, including absolute beginners. So if you're looking for the perfect gift for your friends and loved ones, check out Joe's pattern packs on jhlever.co.uk. And as a special thank you to you, the first 25 orders can get 10% off with the code REVO10. Thanks again to Joe for all the hard work she puts into these videos. And as I say, check out the link in the description below. So back to the plans for the park. So in a simple world, the next step would be to raise some finances and get to work building our vision for the lower area of the park. Unfortunately, as we all know though, we don't live in a simple world, so 
there are some important but bureaucratic steps we need to take first. Many of you who have been to the park before and had to suffer through my ramblings will have known that in the past we've had a bit of a rocky relationship with our local council and this has made it difficult for us to continue the development of the park. For those of you who have ever been rightly disgruntled at the fact that we still have rubbish port at the park, you may be interested in knowing that over the last 10 years we have actually made several attempts to try and install proper toilets at the park but have always struggled to gain permission from our local council. Most notably about five years ago we went through a full planning application for some proper toilets and shower facilities however this process fell apart due to an issue with the site being a former mining site and that prevented us from getting full planning permission. Due to its former use, the site is classified as contaminated land. At some point in the future, I will do a video on the history of the site because it is quite interesting and it goes back a long way. But to give you the basic information, between around the 1600 and 1800s, this site was actually one of the largest lead mines in Europe. And as such, there is a lot of leftover material from the mining area, in particular lead in the ground in the lower area area. The mine itself is deep underground and not so much of the issue however the area that we use for car parking was what was known as the dressing floor where they processed a lot of the ore before transporting it to the train station on the other side of the village. Given that people in the 16 and 1800s were not necessarily the most clean and tidy people they unfortunately left a lot of the material scattered around and that's left a bit of a legacy of issues for the site. Over the years we've worked with the local council and the environmental health department in order to implement a number of measures in order to improve the site and particularly for the safety of visitors and staff. Examples of this are things like signage on the site to make sure people are aware, kit washes, bike washes so you can clean off your equipment before leaving the site um, and also having albeit rudimentary hand washing facilities available for people. Ironically, one of the best things we could probably do for the situation would be to build some proper toilets and showers. However, due to the contaminated land status, we ended up in this catch 22 situation where we weren't able to build toilets because of the contamination, even though they would have actually been a significant benefit for the situation. We've also undertaken a large number of landscaping steps, be it covering the car parks and roads with clean material in order to keep the contaminated material under the ground and topsoiling and grassing many of the exposed areas which not only helps to again keep the material underground it also helps to improve the ecology of the site however the work that we want to do and the continued development of the site will require further consultation with the council and resolving some of these issues once and for all over the last few months we have met with several members of the council particularly in the sort of tourism and business development side who are obviously very supportive of the park and recognize the benefits of it but there are still a number of planning development control issues that we need to satisfy before we be able to undertake any of the work that we're planning. So the first step in order to make these plans a reality is what we're calling a feasibility study. This study will not only develop the long-term detailed plans for the redevelopment of the park, but it'll also undertake a number of professional surveys centered around things particularly like the contaminated land. Once we have these plans and mitigations together, we'll be able to present them to the council and hopefully they will be acceptable and allow us to continue the development. As well as being necessary for the planning and council approval, this feasibility study will form an important part of the information needed to find external funding, be that in the form of public grants or outside investors. Although this kind of bureaucratic step will not seem like the most exciting or fun part of a development, it is unfortunately very necessary and an important step in the future of the park. We are currently working with a number of consultancy firms in order to flesh out the plan for what needs to be in this feasibility study, as well as seeking funding in order to undertake this piece of work. Due to the specialist nature of the design work and the professional surveys required, this piece of work could cost anywhere in between 10 to to 50,000 pounds which is obviously a lot of money and more money than we currently have available to us. Now I know in the past there's been a lot of talk about things like crowdfunding and opportunity we could do like that to raise money for the park and this is something we're certainly looking at doing in the future however it's not something we particularly want to do for this piece of work. As mentioned this is a feasibility study and there is always the possibility that the end result of it will be that the park is not feasible so we certainly wouldn't want to take any money from our community until we are certain that we 
can re-deliver the park. We also think it would be much better to use those opportunities for fundraising for things that are a little bit more interesting and tangible, like for example, building a big jump building, which would then give people an opportunity to actually come and experience the thing that they've supported and contributed to. I don't want to bore you too much with all of the exciting funding applications that I've been undertaking over the last few weeks, but I will give you a few basic details. There is a fund called the Shared Prosperity Fund, which is a Welsh government grant fund, which provides money for this kind of project. Whilst this fund does provide money for feasibility, there's a little bit of an issue right now because the way the fund is broken up into different parts, the part for feasibility studies has kind of run out of money. Now we are hoping that this is going to change in the future. There is going to be a reallocation at some point in the next couple of months, which might put more money into this pot, or they might decide later down the road that they have money left over that they want to put into this pot. Unfortunately though, this is going to take a couple of months to work through this process, so we're probably not going to know where we stand with that until around February, March next year. In the meantime though, we are looking at other funds and other ways to fund this piece of work in order to get the ball rolling. And I would say to you out there that if you are aware of any funding opportunities that you think might be suitable, please do get in touch either through the comments or you can find our contact details on our website, revolutionbikepark.co.uk. Also, while I appreciate it's a big ask, we often get people offering support in order to get the bike park up and running. And if you work in any of the fields that you think might be useful or necessary for the feasibility study, and it's something that you'd be interested in getting involved in, then again, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can use the comments below, but if you'd rather then, as I say, head to our website and check out the contact details there. I would love to be able to give you an exact time scale for the redevelopment for the park, but unfortunately that's difficult at this point. Given that reality and the plans that we have, I would predict that we're probably looking somewhere in 2025 for the to be fully up and running with the plans that we've shown you in this video. That being said though, we are hoping that we can do some events next year. Uh, be those kind of races or sort of one-off jam days, sort of sessioning days, uh, as we begin the work to redevelop the park. Obviously that's all up in the air right now, and as I say, the best thing for you can do is subscribe and follow on this channel, because this will be where we'll be putting out information on those events. So that's about all I have for the plans right now. Hopefully you've found this relatively interesting. We will of course be trying to keep you up to speed as much as possible as we go through these first fill feasibility stages, but hopefully once we get into the more exciting building side of it, we'll be following along as well with videos regularly. So I'm going to leave it there. Once again, I want to thank our video sponsor, jhlever.co.uk. Remember to check out those make-along kits if you're looking for the perfect present for your loved one. And as always, I want to thank you for stopping by at today's video. Hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you check back for the next one.